All right, we're going to dive right back in here where we left off two weeks ago in our study of the will of God, finding and following the will of God. We've broken the will of God into two main categories, and we're gonna, I'm going to go over this several times as we, we get into this so that we can have a good understanding. We have the determinative will of God. The determinative will of God, we say that's what's going to happen. It will happen regardless of man's behavior or of man's decision. We don't have anything to say about it. This is what God has ordained that is going to happen, and there's nothing you can do about it. Then there is the non-determinative will of God. This is the part that we are focusing on, and then we have a subcategory under this that we're focusing on even more. The non-determinative will of God is what may happen. In other words, it's what God desires. Does God have desires and wishes? Absolutely. You can't, you can't read through Scripture and get away from the fact that God, as a person, has things that he desires... There is disappointment, there is grief on the part of God when man goes against God's will or God's desire. The non-determinative will of God is what may happen. It's that which God desires to accomplish through the means of man's voluntary cooperation. God wants you to make the choices that he would have for you to do. If you will make the choices that he would have you to make, then his will for your life, the, the non-determinative will of God, will take place. God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. We're not taking away from that at all. But God does not force himself. He does not force himself upon mankind. He doesn't force man to do his will. Rather, God voluntarily places a limit upon himself. Just like Jesus, when Jesus was walking here on earth, Jesus placed himself and the, the uh, exercising of his divine attributes at the, at the uh, will of the Father. When Jesus was a carpenter in Nazareth, could Jesus have used his thumb to push nails in? Yes, he's God. Did Jesus even need to use his thumb? No, Jesus could snap his fingers or just think about it, and the, whatever he was building would come together. But, but he didn't. He limited himself to the use of his divine attributes to within the will of the Father. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan? He, he, was, he was tempted to turn stones into bread. Is Jesus able to turn stones into bread? Yes, does Jesus need stones? No, Jesus can just make bread. But he was tempted... It's not wrong to want bread. Jesus was tempted to use his divine attributes outside of the will of the Father. And so God limits himself. As we're thinking of ourselves, God limits himself by giving us that free will. We can further divide the non-determinative will of God into two more categories. We have the general will of God. And we have the individual or the specific will of God. The general will of God is found right here. What does God want me to do? Well, if you go home and you have a Bible program on your phone or on your computer or just maybe you have one of the old Strong's concordances and you sit down and you look up the will of God, you will find there are verses in the Bible that says this is the will of God. That's, that's putting... Putting the cookies on the bottom shelf for all of us. You want to know what God wants? Read his word. That's the general will of God. But let's talk about the individual or the specific will of God. What is God's will for you? What is God's specific will for me? That's our primary focus in this study. We began two weeks ago now laying the biblical foundation that God does in fact have a specific will for your life. There are things that God wants for you that if you will if you will walk in the steps that he has prepared for you that you will determine and you will be able to follow and live and enjoy the 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 benefits of God's will. We began in the Old Testament before we can know God's will, we have to have a desire to know God's will. You say that goes without saying. Yeah, but so many things that should go without saying don't, okay? 
if you, if, if we need to get God's will, we have to have a desire to have God's will. And, and when I say we have to have a desire for God's will, I mean in place of my will. I, I have things that I want. You have things that you want. But the sign of a mature believer is when I say not my will, but thine be done. Your will for me, not my will for myself. In Psalm 143, we found this principle. There's a prerequisite for knowing God's will, and it's going to be found in the New Testament as well. Before we would know God's will, we must be walking in fellowship with God. We're going to focus on this this morning especially. Psalm 32, verse 8. I know you're in Psalm 37. You know this verse. It's one that comes up an awful lot. Psalm 32, verse 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. This guidance is what we're looking for. I want God to, and you see in, in this verse, I will instruct thee. It's personal. I will instruct thee and teach thee. I will guide thee with mine eye. I want that for myself. I want that for you. I want that for my, my family. As we know that the will of God, the guidance of God, his teaching is available to us, we look at the context here. Before we get to Psalm 32, 8, we see Psalm 32, 1. Psalm 32, 1 said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. What is it that I have, to, I have to have done before I'm going to be able to receive the will of God? Well, I, I have to have dealt with the sin. I'm not going to receive the guidance, the teaching, and the instruction of God if I'm walking in known and unrepentant sin. And I've given you verse, if, verse after verse saying this. Isaiah says, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you. When I'm walking in sin, when I'm going my own way, and God's back here, and I say, I really, really want God's instruction, if I'm walking in sin, my life is giving the lie to what I'm saying with my mouth. If I'm walking in sin and saying, I want God, that's not possible. If I truly want God, what will I do? I will... Well, we would call it, it's a word, right? A change of mind that results in a change of behavior. It's called repentance. I'm going to repent. And I say, Lord, forgive me for these. I confess these to you. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My sins are forgiven. Now I can have that instruction, that teaching, and that guiding that he speaks of in verse 8. The last principle that we looked at last time that we were here in this study is from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. A verse that you probably have memorized and maybe you have it on a needlepoint somewhere in your house. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. What is necessary before he will direct my path? I must trust, to trust in the Lord with all our heart. If we would find the will of God, we must place our trust in him. That he knows best, that he knows all things, and that he genuinely has our best interest in mind. If I were to ask you to raise your hand if you think God knows everything, every hand would go up. If, you, if I was to say, raise your hand, if you believe that God has power over everything, every hand would go up. And if I were to raise my hand and say, uh, if, if, you, if you believe that God genuinely has your best interest in mind, with all of this power, with all of this knowledge, I, I think every hand would go up. And yet sometimes our lives don't line up with those assents. We would say, yeah, I do. I believe that he's all-powerful. I believe that he's all-knowing. And I believe that he has my best interest in mind, in mind. But I also believe that I can control this particular part of my life better than he can. If we're going to have his guidance, if we're, he's going to direct our paths, it's going to be because we trust in him. Your turn to Psalm 37. 
Let's look at the detail of the will of God. We're looking at it in principle. We're not looking at the details for your life, but in, in principle. There are still some who would say that while God certainly has a will for each of us, that it's really just kind of generic and it's guided only loosely by the principles of Scripture. They'd say, look, it's God's will is, is it's revealed here in Scripture. The general will of God is about as close as we can get to knowing what God really wants for our life. Psalm 37, verse 23. This is the name of our Sunday's, Sunday night series. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. If you're turned there in, in your Bibles to Psalm 37, if you look... Under where your Bible says Psalm 37, it says a psalm of David. The writer, the author here, the penman, if you want to say it that way. Psalm 37, look at verse 4. We're going to see the same principle here. Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Is this verse a blank check from God that says he will give me absolutely whatever I want as long as I, as long as I, I'm going to put it in quotes, as long as you love Jesus, you get whatever you want. Is that what this verse is saying? There's an awful lot of people who take it to say that. Well, if, if you delight yourself in the Lord, then he says he'll give you everything. And here's where I normally, uh, I have people who will come to me at this point, they'll say, and they're angry. They'll say, look. I'm delighting in the Lord, and he didn't give me such and such. <laughs> I, wait, wait, wait. Wait a minute. This is not God signing a check and saying, hey, look, you fill in whatever you want. As long as you love Jesus, I'll give it to you. That's not what this is. What's the, what's the operative phrase in this verse? What's the most important phrase in this verse? The very first phrase. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Meaning, I want what he wants. I have such a close relationship with the Lord that I desire what he desires. And he will give me the desires of my heart because we share desires. It's not that God is going to come around to my way of thinking. Rather, it's if I spend time with the Lord, I will come around to his way of thinking. So when I, when I come before someone angry, I say, God, let me down. This is, this is a lie. <laughs> no, 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 no. If God is not giving me the desires of my heart, it's because our desires are different. Because God says that if my desires, my delight is in him, he will. Delighting in the Lord is only going to be possible if the sin has been dealt with. Is it possible for me to have good fellowship with the Lord if I'm living in unconfessed sin? No. No. It's not going to be possible if I'm not walking with the Lord, if, I'm, if I've dealt with the sin, and if I'm walking in accordance with His general will. Meaning, if I'm doing the things that He said, and I'm walking with him, then I'm going to be in a place where the steps, my steps, can be directed by him, where they can be ordered by him. Let's look, let's look back at verse 23 here, okay? Verse 23 of Psalm 37, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Verse 23, this verse, tells us that the believer who is described as good, Real quick, raise your hand if you feel that you are good this morning. Exactly. Okay. We, but what is this verse talking about? What is, a, what is a good disciple of Christ? What does that mean? A believer. A believer. That's ground floor right there. Must be a believer. What else? Good. What about sin? I'm going to sin, but what am I going to do? I'm going to confess it. I'm not, I'm not going to 
willingly engage in that for which my Savior died. So my sin, how about, how about the commands of God? A good disciple is going to be obeying the commands. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Okay? Verse 23 here of this, this psalm tells us that the believer who is described as good will have special instructions that are not available to the wicked. Are the steps of a wicked man ordered by the Lord? No, the steps of a good man are. We're talking about the specific will of God. We're, we're making the case. Let me give you a, a, a New Testament example of the specific will of God. Open up to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. We've looked at the teaching on the will of God from the Old Testament. Now we're going to just kind of flip over to the New Testament in total. Before we get into the New Testament's teachings about the specific will of God, I want to show you an example of the specific will of God as it is shown here in Acts 16. Acts 16 records Paul's second missionary journey. Let me show you here on a map exactly what we're talking about. On Sunday mornings in, sun, uh, on Sunday mornings in the morning worship service, we're going through Paul's first missionary journey right now. So... Right here we have, can you see my little red dot? It starts from Antioch, and this time he starts and he goes by land. On his first missionary journey, he went by sea. But he starts and he's working his way westward across what we would call Asia Minor. And he's making his way across, and he kind of comes to, to this area where he's, he, he has some questions. If you look in verse 6 of Acts 16, it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia... And the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. And after they came to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Now there's a lot of place names right there. That's not what we need to get tied up in. More, I want you to focus on the Spirit forbid Paul, and in this case, his partner was Silas. The Holy Spirit said, don't preach the gospel here. That's different, isn't it? There was another place. They tried to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit said, don't go that way. Rather, there's something else that's in, in line here. Now, the moral will of God, the general will of God, is for the gospel to be preached to all men. Right? Right? Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. Even the people in Bithynia, do they need the gospel in, in Bithynia too? Yeah. Do they need the gospel in Asia? Well, sure. So what's going on here? The purpose for the Spirit's direction, for his specific guidance for Paul, for his specific guidance in this instance, he was going to send Paul and Silas across the Aegean Sea, and they were going to make their first entrance into Europe. They're going to take the gospel, and you, you hear about Philippi. Philippi is on the other side of that. If you remember hearing about the Macedonian call, that's what this is. They heard a call from someone in Macedonia saying, come and help us, and they would take the gospel into the European continent. But by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, God's will was revealed to Paul and Silas. Let me give you a quote here. I think he phrases it well. He says, it would not have violated the general will of God for Paul to go to the other places. Do you follow me? Because God said, preach the gospel to every creature. It wouldn't have violated the general will will of God for Paul to go to the other places in light of the fact that Christians have been commissioned to go to all the world with the gospel. However, God's specific will was for Paul to go to Macedonia at that time. So he revealed his will, his specific will, to the apostle. Do you follow with me here? The will of God, the general will of God, the specific will of God. What our goal in this whole study is, is for us to be able to find and follow the specific will of God for us. What is God's will for me? 
What is God's specific will for you? To do that, let's turn to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, we're going to talk about wisdom and the will of God. James 1 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth, or he doesn't chasten, because of asking for wisdom. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You see, there's a prohibition and a command in this, in this verse. What does it look like for a Christian to be wise in order to gain this understanding of the will of God? Well, this theme should be familiar from Psalm 32 and Psalm 37. The context of Ephesians 5 is a list of div divine commands. Ephesians chapter 5, if you're turned there and you look at verses 1 and 2, you see that we are to be followers of God. He commands that. In verses 3 and 4, we are commanded to avoid sinful behavior. In verses 5 through 11, we're commanded to keep our associations pure. Then in verses 14 to 16, we're commanded to keep our spiritual guard up and to be alert for Satan's attack. All of these commands are the general will of God for your life. And remember, before you will receive the specific will of God for your life, before he will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go, before he will guide you with his eye, you have to be living in obedience. The recurring theme is that if we want the will of God, we need to be walking with God. Sin confess. And in obedience to his word. And it's in this context. I want verses 1 to verse 16. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. Verse 17. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What's the prohibition in this verse? What does he not want us to do? Be unwise. Don't be unwise. The, the Greek word here means to be ignorant. He says, don't be ignorant. The fact that God commands us not to be ignorant means that he makes provision for us to have the information that we need to not be ignorant. God doesn't command us to do something that is impossible for us to do. He gives us what we need. Don't be ignorant. Don't be unwise, he says, the command, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. To understand, that word itself means to gain insight into, to put together as a puzzle, to reason. As I, as a mature believer who is walking in obedience to the commands of God and to what he would have me to do, as I live this life, I will have the spiritual maturity necessary to put together what God would have me to do. From Ephesians 5.17 and its context, we can learn that it is possible for a godly man to avoid ignorance and to gain insight into the specific will of God for him. To, put, to, to just boil it down into the shortest possible phrase, spiritual maturity brings spiritual insight. The, the better you know God, the more open you will be to his leading. The more you will abstain from sin. The more you will walk in obedience to his commands. The, the closer I am to God, the greater the spiritual insight that I will have into the decisions of my life. That's the command for wisdom. Don't be ignorant. Don't, don't be without wisdom, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Turn to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to talk about walking worthy and the will of God. We're building a case here 
Wisdom plays a part. Walking worthy is also one of the earmarks of one who knows the will of God. The context of Colossians chapter 1, Colossians is one of those prison epistles. It's one of those epistles that where the Apostle Paul is uh, at, at the very least in chains. We don't know. Sometimes he was under house arrest. And so in Colossians, when, the, when it is written, Paul is in prison, and he has received an update about the church in Colossae from a man named Epaphras. And Epaphras comes to where Paul was in prison, and he fills him in, and he kind of gives him the rundown on the church in Colossae because they had mutual friends there. And so Epaphras says, hey, hey Miss so-and-so, she's doing good, and, and, and this brother in the Lord, he's, he's doing well too. We need to pray for so-and-so. And, and so Epaphras lays all of this, this update out for the Apostle Paul. And Paul writes the epistle of Colossians. Epaphras, the general tone of his update was that the Colossian believers are walking in obedience to the teachings of the Word of God. Epaphras gives them a good progress report to the Apostle Paul. He says, Paul, they're doing well. They're walking in obedience. They're doing they're doing what we wanted them to do. They're walking with the Lord. And when he hears of their, their spiritual maturity, what we just spoke about, remember, spiritual maturity brings spiritual insight. When the Apostle Paul hears of their spiritual maturity, he writes in verse 9, Colossians 1, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Do you see the connection? What we just talked about, wisdom, spiritual maturity brings spiritual insight. It's happening. But he goes on in verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. What is Paul's desire for the Colossians? Here in Colossians 1, 9, and 10, what is his desire for these believers? He can't go and see them because he's chained up. He's in prison. He can't go and see them. Paul's desire is for them to grow deeper and stronger in their walk with the Lord. This would be made possible by their knowledge and their understanding of his will. He's, Paul says, look, you guys are doing great. My desire for you is that God will show you his will for you and that you'll do it. That you'll walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. So wisdom is necessary for knowing the will of God. To walk worthy. What does it mean to walk worthy? Well, it, it means to walk in obedience. To, to do those things that wisdom would have you to. I'll have you turn now. The last place I'll have you turn here this morning and I doubt if we'll finish this. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Maybe you saw us getting here eventually. Romans 12 is kind of the hallmark passage on the will of God that we have in the New Testament. You know these verses. They're very well, well familiar to all of you. Some have called this the formula for God's will. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That ye may know, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect what? will of God. These verses bring together all of the principles that we've looked at. In the Old Testament two weeks ago and in the New Testament this morning, it brings all of it together regarding the specific will of God and its discernment. Romans 1, or I'm sorry, 12, 1 and 2 contains three commands for us to obey. If you look at it there in Scripture or up on the screen, we are to present our bodies, we are to be not conformed, and we are to be transformed. Three commands. You want to know the will of God? You want to know specifically what God's will is for you? 
these three commands. This is the, the formula, for, for lack of a better term. What does it mean to present? To present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Well, to present means to place near or beside, to make available. Maybe you have had to work under a car at some time in your life. You don't have a pit, you have one of those creepers. Or maybe you just have your child's skateboard that you're using to get underneath the car. And so you lay on your back and you scooch under the car and, and you've got it up on jack stands and all of that, but it's still kind of a tight fit and it's uncomfortable and there's dirt dripping down on you and all sorts of stuff. And you need a particular tool so what do you do if you're, if you're smart? What do you do before you go under the truck? You get all of those tools together, right? And what is bound to happen? You left one, right? You're gonna, you, you forgot that one piece, and it's usually the first piece that you need. So you get under there, but if you have all of your tools laid out beside you, so you can say, look, as uncomfortable as this is, I'm going to get under here and I will have what I need right where I can reach it, right where I can have it accessible so that I can use it for its purpose. That's what it means to present your bodies a living sacrifice. It means to make yourself entirely available to the Lord Jesus Christ. The presenting of our bodies, he says... It, Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The, the word reason there, it's the, it's the Greek word logikos. You hear an English word in there? Logic. He says, hey, you should present your bodies at the disposal of your Lord and Master. And it just makes sense. It's logical. It's reasonable for you to do this. But why is it reasonable? Well, if you think about it for just a moment, it really only makes sense for I have access to God. God is omnipotent. I am not omnipotent. I am, I am fallible. Or I am weak. God is omniscient. God knows everything. <laughs> Literally everything. Do you know everything? What percentage of everything do you know? It has so many zeros after the decimal, it doesn't pick up, does it? Right? I, I know so very little. He knows absolutely everything. I have such little power, he has all the power there is. He lives outside of time. I'm bound by time restrictions. He loves me enough to send his only begotten son to die for my sins. And to save my soul for all of eternity, why would I not place my life, why would I not place my body and all of my decisions in his control? It, it just makes sense. I have an omnipotent, omniscient, infallible, all-present God, or I can run my own life. What makes sense? Give it to the Lord. <laughs> I can't do nearly as good of a job as he can. It just makes sense. The first command, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And it's reasonable to do so. He's not asking you something that doesn't make sense. Number two, be not conformed to this world. I have at other times done a full exposition of this passage. I'm not going to do that for sake of time here this morning. To, to be not conformed to this world really means to avoid compromise. The word conformed itself means to fashion oneself according to uh, or external shaping rather than internal change. It's, it's being pressed into a mold. In this case, be not conformed to this world. The world means the, the present world, the culture. I'm not supposed to be formed by the culture. I'm not supposed to go to the, the magazines and the TV shows to find out how I should be. I'm supposed to go to God's word, as we'll see in just a moment. As a believer who's seeking the will of God for my life, I'm not to allow culture to press me into the world's mold. 
I'm not to tolerate evil. Going along to get along is not biblical language. We've talked about this at great length in our series where we looked at church history and separation. We are not to be conformed to the world. I'm not to look like the world. Rather, rather than conforming, rather than confirmation, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed. Another Greek word that we're kind of familiar with, it's the Greek word metamorphuo. You hear the word metamorphosis. Okay, that's, that's what it is. What is metamorphosis? It's that process where the caterpillar crawls up on the branch and it makes a cocoon and it goes into the cocoon and then through the, through the divine miracle of metamorphosis, it comes out as something different. It went in as one thing, it comes out as something else. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't allow the world to press you into its mold so that you look like it. Rather, be made into something entirely different. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Rather than being a Christian who looks like the world, a conformed Christian, I'm to be a disciple of Christ whose heart and mind is being sanctified more and more into the image of Christ. Question for you. This transforming that I should have, that you should have, my life should look transformed. I gave it away just a little bit in, in just saying that. Will this internal change, this transforming by the renewing of the mind, will this transformation show up in a public way? Will this, will this being made into the image of Christ, is it just going to be a thing that happens right here in my mind, or will it be evident to those who see me walking around? It will be evident, obviously. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. What is on the inside will eventually come out. If, if I, you, you see me as I'm, I'm going about my life and say, boy, you don't live like a Christian at all. You live exactly like the world. I say, oh, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm probably the most spiritual person you know. What do you think? He said, well, your, your talk, you, you talk this way, but your walk is entirely different. What is on the inside will come out. This transforming will, will be evident. Belief affects behavior. And so why are we doing these three things? Why am I to, uh, according to this verse, why am I supposed to present my body, a living sacrifice? Why am I supposed to not be conformed to the world? Why am I supposed to be transformed by the renewing of my mind? Well, he says here, it's the word that, a causative, a causative word. He says, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You, you want the will of God for your life? You want to know what God wants? One man said it this way, the believer whose mind is being renewed is programmed to process data from his life, to test it in order to discover what the will of God is. The will of God described in this verse, it's described as good, as acceptable and as perfect. Good and acceptable mean exactly what you would think they do. The word perfect means complete. It means fully developed. My walking in obedience is the first step to receiving God's individual specific will for my life. In conclusion, if I'm going to know God's will, if you're going to know God's will, you have to desire it. Meaning, you have to desire His will, not yours. 
That's a difficult thing sometimes because I think I know best. I think I have, well, well, Lord, I don't know if you know, but I have this going on. Yet God knows. I need to desire his will, not mine. Number two, I need to trust God for guidance rather than leaning upon my own very flawed understanding. Number three, I need to confess my sin. I need to walk in obedience. This morning we concluded with Romans 12, 2, talking about a renewed mind. Next week we're going to study, Lord willing, what God's word has to say about our thoughts. What does God have to say about our mind? How does God use our renewed mind to show us his will? We're going to talk about, next week, we're going to talk about our thoughts. And how our thoughts, does God have anything to say about my thoughts? We know he has much to say about our actions. What does he have to say about our thoughts, and how does that tie in to the will of God and determining and following the will of God? Let's bow for a word of prayer here this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, for the truths that it contains. Lord, I pray that you would help us as believers, Lord, that we would have that desire for your will. That we would want to do your will, not our own. Lord, that we would place our complete trust in you. Lord, that we would make ourselves available. That we would present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you. Lord, that we would also, that we would uh, walk a, a life that is well-pleasing to you. Lord, that we, would, that we would deal with sin quickly. Lord, that we would confess, that we would forsake we would walk in the way that you would have us to, so that you can show us the way that you would have us to walk specifically. Lord, we pray now that you bless as we prepare for the main service. I pray that you speak to our hearts in every aspect. In Jesus' name, amen.